Hi there. As I said in my previous videos, policy is moving rapidly and changes are occurring practically every week. And yet again, we have another set series of changes from CMS regarding the Medicare policies. I'm Mei Kwong. I'm the Executive Director at the Center for Connected Health Policy, the federally designated National Telehealth Policy Research Center. And today we'll be talking about the most recent telehealth policy changes in CMS and with Medicare. So a few disclaimers today. Uh, first off, any information I provide today should not be considered legal advice. It's purely for informational purposes. CCHP always suggests that you seek out legal counsel if you're looking for a formal legal opinion. And also know if I happen to mention a company or so some type of product, know that neither I nor CCHP have any type of relationship or financial arrangement or affiliation with such a company. So CCHP was established in 2009 underneath the Public Health Institute as a California telehealth policy organization. An opportunity come the nationally, uh, National Telehealth Policy Resource Center became available in 2012 through a grant from HRSA. We applied for that and we've been serving in that capacity ever since. We also work with a variety of other partners on more specific projects related to telehealth and connected health. Some of the things that we do is a 50 state report and all the state telehealth Medicaid policies, laws, and regulations. We are also the administrator of the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers, and we also convene a group of over 70 statewide organizations in California who are interested in California telehealth policy. The National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers is made up of the 14 telehealth resource centers who all receive federal funding from HRSA to provide technical assistance on telehealth. There are 12 regional resource centers that cover specific states and two national centers that focus in on policy, which is CCHP, and another one on technology. We all work very closely and collaboratively together, so if you reach out to one, I like to say you're actually getting all 14 of us. If you have a specific telehealth question, I really urge you to reach out to your regional telehealth resource center. And as I said, if they can't answer their question, they will consult with the rest of us to try to find the answer for you. As I mentioned earlier, we do track all of the state telehealth Medicaid policies, laws, and regulations. That is a snapshot of the CCHP website where the information is put up on an interactive map. So if you're interested in a particular state, you can just click on it and it'll bring up all the information it's, that's divided into these various categories. Uh, when COVID-19 started, we were actually in the midst of our spring update for this report. So that should be soon up on our website. The information that you find there now as of May 1st, 2020 is good Good through October 2019, but in a couple of weeks, we should have all the updated information good through February of 2020. The COVID information is temporary for the most part for the majority of states, so that is actually on a different section of our website as well, which um, you'll see if you go visit cchpca.org. So what is going on now with CMS telehealth policy? Um, as I said in previous videos, if you've seen them, policy is moving very rapidly and it's changing frequently. And there are actually some significant changes that have been made. So if you had seen any of those previous videos, some of that information is now out of date. So the information as of May 1st, 2020 is this. So for CMS, the Medicare program, fee-for-service, the geographic and site location of the patient has been waived. So what this means is that it opens up to any geographical location the patient can be located in when the telehealth interaction takes place, and the patient can be at home or basically any other type of location um, where they are sheltering in place. The location of the provider, um, the provider can provide the services when they're at home as well, so there's no prohibition for them to do that. The modality issues, and this is one of the most recent changes. So prior to yesterday, April 30th, what CMS had essentially been saying underneath their telehealth policies was you need to use the live video version of, of the modality. That um, store and forward, unless you were in Alaska or Hawaii, did not count, and neither did phone. However, recognizing that many people were receiving services over the phone, they have relaxed that a bit. So what they have done, if you go and click on the list of services that they will cover if delivered via telehealth, you'll see where they specifically mark that you can also provide it by audio only or telephone. So that was a big change that came out yesterday. The type of provider, yet another significant change that was made. 
Previously, there was a very, very limited list of providers who were eligible to provide services via telehealth and get reimbursed by Medicare in their fee-for-service program. The uh, last significant change they made on that a couple of weeks ago was to add FQHCs and RHCs, but the change that they made now, they have opened it up to all healthcare professionals who bill Medicare as long as they're providing a services that Medicare will cover and it's within like their scope of what they can do and bill for. So that has really open things up significantly. So now you have your um, occupational therapists and physical therapists, speech language pathologists eligible to provide services via telehealth. However, keep in mind, they are still limited to that list of services that CMS has said that they will cover if the service is provided via telehealth. Now there were for OTs and PTs some codes on there specific to them, so that, that helps but it is still a limited list. It's about 180, 190 different codes and Medicare I think has like about you know 10,000 codes that they'll cover. So keep in mind that while the list of providers who are eligible to provide services via telehealth and get um, reimbursed by Medicare is expanded, that list as of today, May 1st, 2020, has not quite changed yet. But there may be some hope in that or some changes down the line and I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. What's the amount of reimbursement? So what do you get if you provide services via telehealth? So the amount of reimbursement is that it'll be the same if you're um, uh, on that list of eligible providers, unless you're an FQHC and RHC. An FQHC and RHC, they will receive $92.03. They do not get their PPS rate or their air rate. Um, what the other types of providers will get would, would be what they usually get. For phone, for some of the phone services, they've actually increased the rate of what it would be. So for tele, some telephone services, the rate will actually be higher than what it happened before, and that's including some of the G2010 uh, codes, 2012 codes. They've increased the amount of what they will reimburse. Modifiers, and this is um, a little bit tricky. That actually has not changed for, for the providers, the other providers. It has changed for the FQHCs and RHCs. So, Previously, we had talked about what the policies were for FQHCs and RHCs, and they were supposed to use um, the 95 modifier for services basically between January and June that were provided, and then they were supposed to switch over to a new code, G2025. CMS has changed those instructions, and they're saying, like, if you are an rural health clinic, you start off using G2025 with a CG modifier. You can put 95 on there if you want, but you don't have to. So for services delivered from January to June, rural health clinics use G2025 with a CG modifier. If you're an FQHC, you have to report um, one of the three HIPAA codes, the PPS specific payment code, um, the HIPAA code or CBT code that describes a service with the 95 modifier, and then the G2025 with the modifier. So those are the instructions they've given to FQHCs, and it's diff significantly different than what they told the RHCs. Then starting July 1st, both FQHCs and RHCs, you just use G2025, and you don't have to use the CG modifier if you're a rural health clinic um, starting with that date. A little confusing, um, but it is significantly different than what they had originally come out with a few weeks ago. So FQHCs and RHCs, keep that in mind. So some of the other things, um, the first three things here have not changed. So dialysis patients, hospice, they've like relaxed some of those rules. And then like the provider needs their home address if they're providing the services from home during the telehealth interaction, they don't need to do that. Two things that are new, hospitals and originating site fees. So prior to the changes made in the policy that was just released, hospitals could not build their originating site fee even though they may have like, you know, a hospital professional who's providing a telehealth service. So that professional would like build their service, but the hospital could not build their originating site fee even though this may have been like typically um, something that they would be doing because um, the patient that they're treating would have been like on site at the hospital and they could have originally built the originating site fee. Recognizing that this COVID created a brand new situation, they're saying that if the patient is at home and it is like the, one, the hospital's patient, they can build the originating site fee, the hospital. So they can go ahead and like get some of that coverage and build their originating site fee under certain conditions like the, the patient is um, actually at home and is like a outpatient of the um, hospital. 
they are also saying that the hospital can bill certain telehealth services as well, but they were very specific, only remote outpatient therapy and education services. Again, a recognition that, you know, they may be able to provide some services that with telehealth, but with the patient at home, they typically can't get that um, as they would have had it been in, like in person and we weren't in this COVID situation. So CMS is allowing a little bit of um, flexibility for hospitals to use telehealth and bill for the services. So th again, these are two new changes that we're seeing. And then these are also just um, changes that we had talked about before that we had gone over and had not changed with the new guidance. And then some links were in the resources that you can um, access. This is the FQHC information. As I noted, it was also updated yesterday on April 30th. And again, this has mainly stayed the same. The only difference is, is that the amount of money that FQHCs and RHCs are reimbursed is $92.03, so there was an extra three cents on there. Um, and also in how the FQHCs and RHCs are supposed to bill, and that is the, again, if services provided from January 27th to June 30th, if you're a RHC, use G2025 modifier CG, but then if you're an FQHC, it's a little bit more complicated for you. You're supposed to um, use, uh, you know, a, a series of codes, um, either your PPS specific payment code system, the, uh, and the HICPIC code to describe the services furnished and use the modifier 95 and then also use G2025 as well. Um, and then everything reverts to um, on July uh, 1st to everybody, both FQ FQHCs and RHCs using G2025. So uh, virtual checking codes and um, remote monitoring, these are still, still in play as well. Um, Interestingly, some of these look like they may have been moved over into the, the telehealth services. It looked like maybe one or two codes had made it over to that telehealth list. So that was a little bit confusing um, on there, but uh, for the most part, these have remained the same as well. And then virtual communications. <clears throat> now this is the interesting, um, other interesting part of like the policy changes that were included with uh, the, the CMS guidance issued yesterday on April 30th. So typically to add a service onto the list of eligible services uh, provided via telehealth that Medicare will cover, there is two ways of doing that, or traditionally two ways of doing that. They're called category one test or category two test. And the category one test um, was essentially if the service was very similar to a service that CMS was already reimbursing for um, via telehealth, if it was provided via telehealth. And then um, category two was if, if uh, the member of the public had sent in a code asking for it to be reimbursed and they provided sufficient evidence that it would be basically as good as in person. So kind of a hard standard to meet on, um, for both of them, um, category one and category two. CMS has said like during COVID, this public health emergency, we're gonna temporarily alter that process. We're gonna say now that, you know, we're taking, they call it a sub-regulatory process to modify service to include uh, uh, on services on the Medicare telehealth list. So what they're doing is, is that when they receive a request to add another code, or if they internally identify a code to, to be added to it, um, they are just going to basically post it and say like, we're now covering for this service. So what that means is, is that the public can, seems like the public can submit codes into CMS for them to consider adding that to the list of eligible codes for reimbursement under the Medicare program fee for service. So that is something that if you are, especially one of those new health professionals who are now allowed to use telehealth to provide services and the codes that are currently, the 190 codes that are currently on the telehealth list don't quite fit in with what you do, but you think there's a very good way and reason for you to be able to use telehealth um, to provide that service, you can submit that into CMS for their consideration on adding it to the list of codes. So that that kind of makes it an easier process than what we had pre-COVID-19 with how you got a, a code on the list of eligible services. Um, so I would you know encourage folks who 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 feel like their services you can use telehealth to provide it. There's nothing in the definition for that particular service or that code that telehealth 
you couldn't use telehealth for to consider submitting something into CMS saying, asking them to formally look at and like possibly add that code on the list of eligible service for reimbursement. And that is it for the changes that happened on April 30th. Now, again, I warn you, the recording of this video is on May 1st, 2020. Policy has been moving at a rapid pace. There could be like another series of policy changes in another week or in a couple of weeks. So uh, check back on here frequently, sign up for the CCHP's newsletter so you can be up to date on all the policy changes that are going on and um, be very mindful of when of the dates that we put on information because that'll tell you if you have the most recent information as well. So thank you very much.